And then once we were up in the air, you know, when things are quiet, all of a sudden he comes on the intercom and he says, you are getting sleepy. You are not thirsty. There is nothing that you need. You are very sleepy. And then he comes on again and says, okay, so the food uh, in, the, in the cabin today, we're having filet mignon and a fine wine and twice baked potatoes. And as soon as we're done eating that, we'll come around and serve you pretzels. <laughs> And it starts at the top for them because um, years ago, they started using the phrase just plain smart. They thought that was very clever, just plain smart. Well, what they didn't know was that Stevens Aviation had already been using the phrase plain smart. So they threatened a lawsuit and said, you know, we have the copyright on plain smart. You can't use just plain smart, so we're going to sue you. So they thought about it, and then the CEOs got together, and they decided that rather than suing each other, that what they would do would, would be to arm wrestle for the phrase. <laughs> yes. So they actually rented a wrestling facility, a big wrestling facility in Dallas, and they were going to do two out of, uh, whoever won two out of three would get the, get the phrase, plain smart. So they did a video of the CEO uh, working out, and he's doing his sit-ups with a cigarette and a glass of whiskey. <laughs> and uh, they, they uh, arm wrestled, and um, Stevens Aviation ended up winning the right to the phrase. They also, they also uh, said whoever loses has to pay $5,000 to a charity. So they ended up raising $15,000 for charity, and Stevens Aviation won the phrase, and they just immediately granted it to Southwest so that they would share it. So just, just plain smart and plain smart. But what a nice, fun way, out of the box way to deal with stuff instead of it's like, oh, it's so serious all the time. It's like, bring some fun and enjoyment. If you find yourself in a plateau, in something that you're doing, how can you begin to open the doors and let some fun into it? You know, we have a prime example of that down in Pike's Place Market with the flying fish, yeah? I mean, you know, uh, it was boring, you know? The, the, the owner was saying how boring, what a job. I mean, you get your fish and you walk over and you put it away and then you sell it. It's like, oh my God. And then he decided one day, you know, let's just have some fun with this. Let's perform. And so they started throwing the fish around and, you know, cr and they encouraged the performance, they encourage the fun. And they said, you know what? Even if people don't buy fish from us, at least we know we've made a difference. And when they leave, they're happier, they're smiling, they're laughing. Something has changed in them, however minutely. So they become masters in, in what they're doing. So I had the privilege of um, seeing Paul McCartney, a true master, at Wrigley Field on Monday. He played on Sunday and Monday night. And, you know, he is 68 or 69 years old, and he played for three hours, two nights in a row in 92 degree heat. And he never, like, backed off and let other people, like, take the lead. He was always on stage um, completely. And when I look at the steps of mastery, you know, love what you do, he obviously loves the music. Um, commit to your craft. I mean, he's consistently played throughout decade after decade after decade and practiced that. And, you know, in the beginning when he was with John, they would just hang out at each other's house and they would play and they would play and they would write and they would play, but they were having fun. And I think that was part of the Beatles' draw was they were actually having so much fun with what they did. And what he did on the, at the concert is he brought that element of fun and mastery to the concert. My son lives a couple blocks from Wrigley Field, so we got there early and ended up eating outside um, at, a, at a cafe having dinner. And at 4.30, and the concert starts at 8, at 4.30, all of a sudden I hear music coming out of Wrigley Field, and we're talking speakers that are like a story tall, they're huge. And all of a sudden, Paul is singing. 
and he sang for 45 minutes doing a sound check, just singing random songs, but his voice went through the whole neighborhood. And my son said the day before he was waiting for the L on the L platform, and there's paperback writer, and everybody waiting for the train is singing, and the train comes, and they're like, yeah, let the train go, I'll get the next one, and they're up there singing. <laughs> and, it, and it was so fun to, to hear him in the background. One of the things that I see him as being a master is how well he can embrace uh, a, a community. So at Wrigley Field, there's 40, maybe 50,000 people, and for three hours, everybody sang with him. They sang their hearts out, and it was so uplifting, and it was so fun, and at the very beginning of it, he, he said, okay, wait a minute. It's a summer night, it's beautiful, we're in Chicago, we're at Wrigley Field, and we've got music ahead of us. What could be better? And he said, and I want you all to stop for a minute. He said, soak it in. But just stop and soak in where we are right now. And then he just stopped. And you could just feel everybody just kind of looking at each other and, and anchoring in the moment, just really being present. So. I have a little short video clip that I want to show you, and I want to explain that it's on a little Canon camera. There was no intention for me to try to do a good job videoing. I was simply moving it like this, so you're going to be moving like this. I did edit it down, and so the first part is uh, Hey Jude, and then the second part is Obla Di Obla Da. So, Again, what's, what is amazing to me is how 40,000 people sing, Obla di, Obla da, life goes on, bra. I mean, what does that even mean, you know? And everybody, nobody cared. They were just, and you know, uh, with all the stuff that goes on in the world, boy, it's just fun to have fun and just sing and be uplifted. So Annie, if you want to, or Billy's up there, if Billy would like to turn that on.
And I wanted to show that because you can feel the energy. And what I loved about what he did is he just backed off and stopped singing and kind of became the backup band for the whole stadium of people. And again, it is, it, it is, a, it is a sign of a master. So as we pursue our dreams, let us recognize that there are masters all around us. They're in our lives, they're in our families, they're our neighbors, they're our co-workers, they're our teachers. And to just stop and acknowledge what they bring to you, what they, what they know and the gifts that they have. And I invite each one of us here to release the hacker, you know? Really show up for, for the things that we're doing. Release the dabbler, release the obsessor, and just ride out those plateaus because are they boring yeah they're boring sometimes but but it's the practice that brings us to the present moment and it's the practice that that touches us helps us touch the eternal now so love what you do commit to your craft practice your skills and have fun